In this video, we're going to start looking at some examples of integration using partial fractions. Now, integration using partial fractions can be broken up into a few different types or a few different forms. And the first one we're going to look at is when the denominator contains distinct linear factors. So linear obviously means it's a power of one, it's a polynomial with degree one. Distinct means there's no repeated factors in the denominator. So for example, here we have in the denominator x plus three times two x plus one. If it wasn't distinct, we would have something like x plus three all squared. So that means x plus three is repeated twice. Okay, so in this case, we don't have any of those. We're just looking at distinct linear factors in the denominator. Now, we already said that there's different types of partial fractions, but there's also different ways of doing a partial fraction decomposition. And it's recommended that you learn all of these types because in some examples, a combination of all three will be useful. So let's start looking at this first example. The first thing we want to do is we want to write our fraction five over x plus three into two x plus one. We wanna write that as two separate fractions, one with a denominator of x plus three and one with a denominator of two x plus one. Now what goes on top? Now, if you look back to the previous video, where we looked at the theorem regarding partial fraction decomposition, it said that the numerator was going to have a degree less than the denominator. Now here we have a denominator of degree one. So that means that the numerator has to have a degree zero, which means that it's just a constant. So on top, I'm going to have some constant a, and here I have another constant b. And maybe we'll write that here. a and b are constants. Okay, so our job now is to find out well, what is A and what is B. And this is where we have three different ways of finding out these constants. And in these examples, well, at least in this first example, I'm going to do all three, just so you get a feel of how to do those. Okay, so the first type is known as equating coefficients. So what we have is we have, let's write this again, five over X plus three times two X plus one. Now we already said it wants to, we want it to be equal to these two fractions here, but let's actually now rejoin those two fractions. So if we were to make a common denominator, obviously the common denominator is x plus three, two x plus one. And what would our numerator be? It would be a times two x plus one plus b times x plus three. Okay, so now I have two fractions, their denominators are the same. And if they're to be equal, that means that their numerators have to be the same. So we can say that five has to be equal to a times two x plus one plus b times x plus three. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what the coefficient of x is on each side. So first we'll start off by looking at the coefficient of x which is really x to the power one. So on the left hand side, what's the coefficient of x? Well, there is no x term, so the coefficient of x is zero. On the right hand side, what's the coefficient of x? Well, that's going to come from multiplying a by two x and b by x. So we're going to have two times a plus b. Okay, so that's the coefficient of x on the right hand side. And so here we've got one equation. Let's have a look at the coefficient of x to the power zero. And what is x to the power zero? That's really one. So in, when we say the coefficient of x to the power zero, we really mean what is the constant term? So on the left hand side, the constant term is five. And where do we get a constant term on the right hand side? That comes from a times one and b times three. So that's going to be a plus three b. And that is equation two. And now all we have to do is we have to solve these two simultaneously. That gives us a equals negative one and b is equal to two. 
Okay, so what does that mean? That means that this fraction 5 over x plus 3 times 2x plus 1 has now been decomposed into two separate fractions. The first one is negative 1 divided by x plus 3 plus 2 divided by 2x plus 1. Okay, and so we've done our partial fraction decomposition. And that was using the method known as equating coefficients. The second method is known as substitution, and it begins in the same way as the method of equating coefficients. We get to this line, 5 equals a into 2x plus 1 plus b into x plus 3. Now, as the name suggests, we need to start substituting something in. And what we want to do is we want to make a substitution for x, which eliminates all but one of the unknown constants. So the easiest one to make at the start is going to be x equals negative 3. So when x is equal to negative 3, well, the left-hand side is unaffected by x, so that stays as 5. Then we get a times 2 times negative 3 plus 1. But what happens to the b term? We're going to have b times negative 3 plus 3, which is b times 0, which is 0. So this term disappears. It just becomes 0. And we're left with only one unknown, which is a. So a is equal to, well, 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, plus 1 is negative 5. And then we can divide by negative 5, and we get a is equal to negative 1. Now we need to do the same, but eliminating the a constant. So what value of x is going to eliminate the a constant? Well, it's precisely the thing that makes that term 0, which is going to be x equals negative a half. Okay, what do we get? On the left-hand side, we still have 5. On the right-hand side, the first part becomes 0. And then we have b times negative a half plus 3. Negative a half plus 3 is going to be 5 on 2. And then when we divide by 5 on 2, that gives us b equals 2. And so you can see that we've actually got the same values for a and b, which is a good sign. It means that both, both of these methods work. So whoop, that should be a 5 on top. So 5 over x plus 3 into 2x plus 1 is equal to negative 1 over x plus 3 and plus 2 over 2x plus 1. Okay, so we get the same partial fraction decomposition using the substitution method as we did with the equating coefficients method. The third method is known as the Heaviside cover-up method. Now, it's also called the limit method because it involves limits to find the unknown constants. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So let's call this equation, or this line here, let's call that star. Now, what we're going to do Let's start by trying to find the constant a. Okay, to find the constant a, we need to multiply by its denominator. So we're going to multiply star by the denominator of the fraction involving a, which is x plus 3. Okay, what do we get when we do that? On the left-hand side, we have 5 divided by 2x plus 1, because the x plus 3s will cancel. That's equal to a plus b over x plus 3 times 2x, oh, sorry, divided by 2x plus 1. Okay, and now what we do is we take a look at the limit as x approaches negative 3. Why do we look at the limit when x approaches negative 3? Well, it's because of this part. We want to look at the limit as x approaches whatever makes this 0, and that is negative 3 in this case. So... The limit as x approaches negative 3 of the left-hand side, and the limit as x approaches negative 3 on the right-hand side. Now, for the first example, we'll do all the steps, but later on you'll see that this can actually be done much quicker than what we're doing here. 2x plus 1. Okay, on the left-hand side, what do we have? Well, we have 5 divided by... Now, we can sub in negative 3 for x because it's not going to make the denominator 0. 
and that will give us 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. On the right hand side, a is not affected by the limit, so it stays as a. But you can see that since this part has been multiplied by x plus 3 on top, that's going to become 0. So this will be plus 0. And so therefore, we get a is equal to 5 divided by negative 5, which is negative 1. Okay, now we can do a similar thing by multiplying our start equation by 2x plus 1. So this is now to find the value of b. We multiply by the denominator of that fraction, which is 2x plus 1. So what do we get? We might as well put the limit in straight away. We're looking at the limit as x approaches negative a half. And that's going to be of what? Well, if we multiply everything by 2x plus 1, this becomes 5 over x plus 3 on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, well, we have the limit as x approaches negative a half of a times 2x plus 1 divided by x plus 3 plus b. Okay, so we have 5 divided by negative a half plus 3 is positive 5 on 2. That's equal to the first part here, the, the term involving a becomes 0, and then b is unaffected by x, so it's not affected by the limit. So therefore our b is going to be 2. And so once again we've recovered that a is negative 1 and b is 2. So our partial fraction decomposition of 5 divided by x plus 3 into 2x plus 1 is going to be negative 1 on x plus 3 plus 2 over 2x plus 1. So in all three cases we've got the same answer, which is a good sign. So now that we've actually done the decomposition, we're able to do our integral. So the integral of 5 divided by x plus 3 into 2x plus 1. Well now we, we know how to rewrite that integrand we can write it as negative 1 divided by x plus 3 plus 2 over 2x plus 1. And these things are much easier to integrate. These are both going to turn out to be logarithms. So in the first case, what's the derivative of x plus 3? It's just 1, and that's what we have on top. So we have that minus sitting at the front, and then this is going to turn into log of x plus 3. And then in the second fraction, what's the derivative of the denominator? It's 2, which is exactly what we have in the numerator. And so this is going to turn into the logarithm of 2x plus 1. And of course, plus our constant c. And that is the final answer. Here we have another example where we need to use partial fractions to solve an integral. And once again, we have distinct linear factors in the denominator. So we want to write our integrand, 7 minus 5x, divided by x plus 1, x minus 2, x minus 3, as a, a sum of three separate fractions. So the first fraction has a denominator x plus 1, the second fraction has denominator x minus 2, and the third has a denominator x minus 3. Now once again, our numerators have to have a degree which is less than the degree of the denominator. And since the denominator is linear, the numerator for all of these has to be a constant term. Okay, now, we've already seen three ways in which we can find these. In this example, I'm going to use the heavy side cover-up method. So, to work out a, it's just going to be the limit as x approaches negative 1 of our integrand times x plus 1. But when I times by x plus 1, it's going to cancel with that x plus 1 factor in the denominator. So I'm going to be left with 7 minus 5x over x minus 2 into x minus 3. Now remember, we don't have to look at the b and c terms because we know that they're going to go to 0 when we evaluate the limit. Working this, this limit out will give us 7 minus negative 5, so 7 plus 5 in the numerator, divided by negative 1 minus negative 2 is negative 3, and negative 1 minus negative 3 is negative 4. So we have 12 divided by 12, which is just 1. 
To work out b, we need to look at the limit as x approaches positive 2 of our integrand times x minus 2. And when we times by that x minus 2, it'll cancel with the one in the denominator. So we're left with 7 minus 5x divided by x plus 1 into x minus 3. And now we can evaluate our limit. So we have 7 minus 10 on top divided by 3 times negative 1. So that's negative 3 divided by negative 3, which is going to be, again, positive 1. And for C, we have the limit as x approaches positive 3 of our integrand times x minus 3. And once again, the x minus 3 is going to cancel with the x minus 3 in the denominator. So we're left with 7 minus 5x over x plus 1, x minus 2. Evaluating our limit gives us 7 minus 15 divided by 4 times 1. So we have negative 8 divided by 4, which gives us negative 2. So therefore, our integral, which we'll just call i, is going to be 1 over x plus 1 plus 1 over x minus 2 minus 2 over x minus 3. Okay, so now we've rewritten our integrand into these separate into, uh, separate fractions, which are much easier to integrate. And so the integral of the first one is going to be log of the denominator. The second one will be, again, log of the denominator, and then minus 2 times log of the denominator. So these integrals should be fairly standard now. And now that is our final answer.